Good afternoon. My name is Mike Dunbar. I work with Drs. Aaron Gassman and Matt O'Neill. Out of the Department of Entomology at Iowa State University, we're with the IPM group, and today I want to talk about one aspect of my dissertation work. Uh, it's going to deal with the uh, cover crops and uh, arthropod communities. So let's start big picture. In 2011, 67 million hectares of corn and soybean were produced in the United States. That's quite a lot. Um, production over the last decade has increased, especially with corn, and so has um, price for both commodities has tripled in the last 10 years. So these are very high demand things. Um, since it's high demand and high production, that obviously, as we're all here, uh, questions the level of sustainability. Um, that in terms, uh, both of these crops have uh, large inputs. Uh, there are environmental impacts as well as human health impacts involved with these. And as uh, Eileen mentioned yesterday, you have a large amount of open brown during the, uh, I guess you can say the off season. Um, and that, that leads to it, uh, soil erosion. The soil takes, um, it's, it's, it's highly valuable. It takes a long time to produce and a very short amount of time to lose. So as, again, why we're all here, there are um, different management strategies that can be uh, employed to mitigate some of these effects. And I'm interested in the benefits of cover crops. Again, as Eileen alluded to yesterday, um, we know the agronomic benefits. It's a reduction of uh, soil erosion and increased nutrient retention, uh, retention. And if you dig into the literature, you can actually find benefits of cover crops in terms of pest suppression. If we think about a rye cover crop in terms of weeds, it's, a, it's allelopathic both when it's alive and after it's been killed. It also competes physically with that weed in terms of shading and um, for other resources. There's also uh, insect pest suppression, and this is because um, that cover crop, our rye cover crop, uh, produces habitat for our natural enemy community. And natural enemies is something that's gonna compete either directly with our pest or it's gonna predate on that pest. So with that, we wanted to measure how this rye cover crop is gonna affect key arthropod taxa in those communities. So how do we do this? It's a very simple setup. We're looking at uh, plots that are annually rotated between, between corn and soybean, and those plots that are annually rotated corn and soybean with a rye cover crop. That rye is seeded in the fall, destroyed uh, two to three weeks before planting of the primary crop. Here you can see a picture. The small picture is actually an aerial footage of the Gilmore sites. And this bigger picture is actually from 2012. I'm mainly going to be talking about 2011 data. But this is the ISU ag site. You can very clearly, even after the rye's been destroyed, see where, where the rye is grown and where it hasn't been grown. That side, I left that side. Um, that's where the rye is. This side isn't, sorry. So we sampled these sites um, five times throughout the growing season. And we took a series of measurements. I'm only going to talk about four of them today. The first one is ground cover. Ground cover is important as a habitat for our natural enemy computer, or computers, um, natural enemy um, community. So basically, it's, it's a really simple measure. You go into these plots, and you're looking what is physically covering the ground. And you measure it to about a 5%, and you can see how, how, how much habitat there is there for that natural enemy community. Our second um, measurement is we scouted for soybean aphids. Um, soybean aphids is a relatively new pest to the Midwest. It invaded at about 2000. It's been here 12 years. There are um, reported cases of yield loss of up to 50%. So this is a very, very important pest. There are economic thresholds and economic injury levels already laid out in the literature for this pest. It's 250 aphids per plant. And at that point, the management of the field needs to think about applying an insecticide with about seven to 10 days before that popula population reaches about 675. At that point, you're gonna to start to lose economic, economically on your yield. Now, going out and counting 250 aphids per plant, I'd rather not do that. So there's a very, very, very quick way to do it called speed scouting. All you need to do is go out and you count to 40. If it's above 40, that, that plant gets a plus. If it's less than, it gets a minus. You, you accumulate enough pluses, the field needs to be treated within seven to 10 days. You accumulate enough minuses, the population's not large enough to really cause any economic concern. So we had two other measurements, and those of you who are out this morning, you saw these firsthand. There's pitfall measurements where we're measuring activity of, of the ground-dwelling arthropods. Um, they stay out in the field for about 24 hours. The insects moving around on the ground fall right inside and you capture them. And then we also measured the uh, communities in the canopy. This is using a sweep net. So for these two measurements, we then took the, the, what we found and we grouped them into different categories. One category was beneficial taxa. So these are like our natural enemies. So here we see a spider. That's a very voracious predator on the ground. In the middle, we see uh, an ichneumonid, which is a, a family of, of wasps that are 
they're parasitoids of aphids. They lay their eggs inside and the young hatch out. And next, uh, you see like a nabbit, which is kind of a general uh, predator. And that's an immature nabbit actually feeding on a soybean aphid right there. We also classified groups into pests. Like you see a western corn rootworm here. In the middle, you see a soybean aphid. On the far side, a bean leaf beetle. Now, pests weren't always pests in that sense. A western corn rootworm found in the soybean is not a pest. It's a pest in corn. Bean leaf beetle, I don't really care if we find it in, in, a, in a corn field. I care if I find it in a soybean field. So we also had a third category, which was neutral, but we're not really going to go into that data. So everyone's kind of familiar with this map. My apologies to South Dakota. You didn't have a field site, so I kind of cut you. Um, I only went to two fields for cover crops in 2011. Since in 2012, we have expanded into Missouri, into Freeman Farm. But I'm only going to talk about the ISU Ag and the Gilmore sites in Iowa. So what did we find? Let's start with ground cover. So across the y-axis, we have, we have percent ground cover. X-axis, we have our sample dates. And this, there's actually six. The first one would be before planting, when the rye was still alive. And the next five are throughout our growing season. Uh, the dark green bars indicate plots with soybean. The light green bars are soybean grown with that rye cover crop. Um, then you have Gilmore and ISU Ag. Um, this is going to be the trend throughout this talk. We saw differences in date. We don't, there's always going to be variation through the year. We're not really concerned with that. But there was not a difference between our treatment. Um, why, why that occurs, we'll, I'll tell you why I speculate at the end of the talk. So let's move to ground cover and corn. Same axis, um, percent, ground percent ground cover on the y-axis are sample dates along the x. Blue is now uh, plots with just corn. Light blue is that corn grown with a rye. Again, a difference by date, but not by treatment. We're looking at uh, speed scouting for aphids. Uh, the ISU ag plot had absolutely no aphids. We could you know, pretend that the natural enemy community was so strong that there were no aphids, but most likely there just were no aphids. And Gilmore actually looked like there was not going to be any aphids until about August, when three plots came back with a treat decision. Um, the, one was a soybean. The other two were soybean with rye. That's really not going to make a difference. Aphids move from their native um, buckthorn host, and they, they migrate, and they just land wherever there's soybean, pretty much. So they're not going to really choose. But So this speed scattering is almost more of an indirect, indirect measurement of how that natural enemy community is functioning. Um, so they actually did apply for, they did apply uh, with an insecticide in August in, at Gilmore. So sweep netting, these are, again, measurements of this community um, in the canopy. If we start with beneficial insects in the soybean, the y-axis, I have this um, mean abundance. X-axis, we have our sample dates. Dark green is, again, soybean by itself. Light green soybean with that rye. Again, the same story. Difference by date, that's not surprising, but no difference between our two treatments. We move to the pest community in soybean. Again, um, abundance on the y, sample dates on the x. Still, different by date, not by treatment. It's a, it's a reoccurring theme. Um, if we move on the corn, same axes. Um, dark blue, again, is the, the corn plots. Light blue is the corn growing with the rye. We, uh, the beneficial community in the cornfields, we're not, we're not seeing a difference by treatment. We are seeing it by date. Same with the pest community. Now let's move on to pitfalls. Pitfalls, we're only going to be talking about uh, beneficial insects. So these are going to be like spiders, which are very voracious predators. Um, ground crickets, which are uh, consumers of the weed seed bank. And then you also have um, uh, ground beetles, which are a little bit of both. And if you see us in the field, you will see this kid wearing this shirt. He never, ever, ever takes it off. It's very, you could pick us out a mile away. So um, x-axis, we have abundance. Or y-axis, we have abundance. Excuse me, x-axis, we have our um, sample dates, same colors as before. Again, it's the same story. Um, we don't see a difference by treatment. And when we move to pitfalls in cornfields, it's the, again the same story. So we saw no differences in terms of percent ground cover. We saw no difference um, between our, with our beneficial and arthropod communities by treatment. And this is for both corn and soybean. Why? Or, and, and why is this important? So I, I, have, I have two thoughts. Let's think about conditions one. In, in 2011, we had a proper winter. We had a proper winter, and so that rye, when I came in in the, in the early spring, it's about up to my ankle. And pretty much four to five weeks after it was destroyed, there was, I needed a plot map to know which, which plots had rye and which, which didn't. Come to 2012, which I'm data not showing here, I went to Gilmore, and that rye is halfway up my ankle, and I still don't need a plot map to find where that rye was and where that isn't. 
So it's going to really support those our communities. Here's hoping. The other thing is um, management of management of these cover crops. So I'm saying conventional management of cover crops is that destruction two to three weeks beforehand, versus when we see in the literature in terms of um, benefits for arthropod communities, it's more of a living mulch, so that that cover crop is now extending into the growing period of the primary. But we know for if we're growing a rye cover crop in corn, that's going to have negative impacts in terms of, of yield. So we don't want to compete. So we're starting to ask the question, how can we bridge this gap? We still have our agronomic benefits of a cover crop, but still have some insect benefits, because conservation of beneficial insects is really important. They may not be able to stop like a mass outbreak of an insect pest, but for those mild, the low infestations where a manager still might have to apply an insecticide, having a healthy beneficial insect community May, may actually, you know, they may be able to manage that, that low infestation of pests, therefore preventing an, an un unnecessary application of insecticide and reducing environmental, environmental inputs. So with that, um, I'd like to thank the small army of people who helped me, and I'll be happy to take any questions you have. Anybody have a question? Yes. So the question is, do, does, is plot size going to have an impact on, on what we see? To a point, yes. So we, we like to avoid the very small ones, and you also want to avoid the humongously big ones. So we, we feel that, for the most part, we've chosen medium-sized plots, enough so the insects that can move, can move and choose, but aren't so drowned in a, in a plot so big that they can't, or so small where they're just going to be everywhere anyway. Yes? How would you I didn't, luckily, but with an herbicide. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, yeah, I just piggyback on their plots. It's very nice for me. Anyone else? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.